Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. What up, what up, what up, podcast party, people, how you doing, how are you living, how are you hanging, world treating you good, is the world treating you bad, is the world treating you indifferently, I don't know, I don't know about you but I'm doing alright, although my throat is exceptionally sore. I was singing all day yesterday and uh, and the day before, but I was working on the new record yesterday, laid down some raging vocals, but whew, two hours later, I'm like, <sighs> just woke up today. I was like, Ugh, all right, I'm going to try not to talk as much as possible, although that's kind of impossible when you've got a podcast intro for KK Downing to do. I tell you what, that was abrupt. I don't like when I do that. I'm going to time that a little better. I tell you what, super stoked for my guest. So stoked for my guest today. Dude, KK Downing, bro. Judas Priest, bro. KK's Priest, bro. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be be a good one. I'm telling you, this was a good one. This was a really good one. If you're a Judas Priest fan, if you're a heavy metal fan, if you are a fan of rock and roll history, dude, this has got it all. This motherfucker, this motherfucker has lived a lot of life. I love talking to people like this. You know, it's like they've just been through so much of the rock and roll insanity. And, uh, and yeah, man, he was great. I, uh, I went to a car show over the weekend with uh, buddy Steve. It's Coach Steve. I, I still call him Coach Steve. I should probably stop calling him Coach Steve because he's my son's coach, but he's not my coach, but I just call him Coach Steve because that's what I've called him for years. And uh, he's super cool. Super cool. And uh, he was like, hey, I'm going to a car show. Like It's in Pleasanton. Why don't you go with me? And I was like, yeah. I don't know. We woke up. It was like a really foggy gloomy day i was like hmm, yeah i don't know but then it cleared up and i was like fuck yeah let's go let's go do it drink some beers walk around look at some old fucking badass cars 50s cars 60s cars fucking super tricked out brand new challengers and brand new corvette i mean there was hell like so many cars it was awesome they had like a little drag little drag strip you know where people could go and race their you know, a lot of dudes just racing like a fucking, you know, Datsun 280Z, <laughs> like some fucking <laughs> kind of shot car. But hella fun. You can go as fast as you want. And it's put on by the good guys, this uh, this one car show. But it was cool, man. It was super good. We drank some beers, fucking tripped around. I, t- I put a bunch of it up on my Instagram stories, though it's already gone now because, as you may know, the Instagram stories only last 24 hours. But I'm, I'm all about the stories. I like that shit. I was like, I don't need to hear motherfuckers' comments. But there were some sick cars, dude. Sick cars. Cool fucking, like, Camaros and Impalas and old 60s Chevelles. And yeah, it was it was rad. Although, I got to say, one of my favorite cars there was this super tricked out Dodge Challenger that had, like, all this lowrider shit drawn on the inside of the hood. So you open up the hood and that whole little panel there, they had painted it with like, you know, money and dice and booze and guns. And then they had like a low rider chick all like flipping you. I was like, holy shit. Like it was the sickest paint job. It was so fucking rad. Cool shit. They had some low rider bikes. A lot of, a lot of Trump shirts, a lot of let's go Brandon shirts (laughs) everywhere. You know, it's a bunch of old timers and shit, but it was fucking, it was fun. It was a blast, man. We had a really good time. Had a really good time, came back. We were talking about, um, 
<laughs> he started telling me he had a buzz and I had a buzz. And he was telling me about this book called uh, She Comes First. And it was like, <laughs> it's just about like, I think it's just about eating pussy. Like that's just like an instructional manual on how to eat pussy. And I was like, that's a good book. Like that, that's a good book for the world to have. I didn't, why didn't I know about this book? It didn't exist when I was learning, you know, how to eat pussy in my teenage years. But uh, I was like, I could have read that book. I could have used that book. And uh, I think every man could use that book. You know, like learn how to eat pussy. Just learn, and she. The book's called "She Comes First, So the whole the whole thing is delayed satisfaction. I was like, it was good. We were talking about it. We were fucking cracking up. It's pretty funny. But that book, he's like, tell me about that book. I'm like, I got I got to check out that. But he sent me the link and everything. He's like, check out the book. <laughs> so I'm reading it. I'm just on the. And in fact, I'm kind of I read on my iPad, and I'm kind of annoyed because my. Uh, I I was kind of annoyed because my iPad won't connect to the iTunes store and now I can't download the book. It just says cannot connect to the store. I don't know. Maybe my iPad's too old. It is. A, it's pretty old. Like it's fucking, I've had it for a while. I think it's a two. So it might not just register anymore. I can still read all the books that are on there. I love reading on the iPad. I got the little, little stand that goes around it. You know, it's like a, it's like a case, but it turns into a stand. Oh, it's the best. I'll never read. I'll never read a book again, ever. Um, let's see what else. I started listening to. I started listening to. I'm going to the Metallica 40th anniversary shows uh, coming up in December, and I had reached out to Lars and uh, buddy Lars, and they're going to get us in, which was super nice of them. And uh, and then during the course of that, I was talking with uh, my buddy my buddy and he was telling me that they that Metallica just started a podcast and I was like oh wow they're starting a podcast they're doing a podcast too holy shit everybody's doing a podcast anyway like I said like I said when I launched my podcast I'm pretty late to the podcast game <laughs> fuck you know Jamie Jossa started his like eight years ago I was like that's that's where I should have been oh well anyway um I started listening to some of it it's pretty cool. You know, it goes into uh, its interview. It's kind of like it's cut together really, edited together really fast. Like they have like a couple of quotes and they play like music and do this stuff. It was a little hard to concentrate because it was just edited so fast. But uh, but some of the stuff, it's going back to the early days. And, you know, a lot of the stories I've already heard, like I've, you know, kind of followed Metallica and I'm a fan and I love Metallica and will always love Metallica. But uh it was cool. There was a couple of little things that I hadn't heard before, and to kind of hear it all condensed into a story with them telling it and in their voice is pretty cool. And uh, at one point, Lars is talking about, you know, he's talked about how um, and he's talked about this before, but like, you know, so many people are, uh, you know, their 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 attachment to Metallica goes beyond music, just like it does with any band. You know, it's like the band you lose your virginity to is you know, like you lost your virginity to master of puppets. So you always remember master of puppets, right? Which I think is a, a good analogy. Cause it's very true. You know, like the band that you lose your virginity to, or, you know, or, or just a band that you had sex, you know, when you first started having sex, like music that was playing in the background, like obviously it holds, you're like, Oh my God, my first time getting laid. And, uh, and I got I got to thinking I was like it wasn't Metallica for me like Metallica wasn't the band I was listening to a lot it was uh it was Merciful Fate I remember listening to when I first started, I, I remember the first couple times I had it we didn't have any music on I don't think and uh, but then uh, but then when we did play music it was Merciful Fate for some reason which is like not really the best like it's not like the best love making music I guess but. It's not the worst. I remember it being like good tempo, had some nice dynamics and, you know, you could get into, uh, you know, they did have, they did sing about sex to some degree, you know, like they're kind of like, you know, nuns have, you know, it's always talking about nuns or, you know, <laughs> like sacrifices or whatever. So it was, uh, but yeah, those were, those were some of my early memories of having sex. What's the music that you listen to? when you first had sex, what were you playing in the background? The first, 
three or four times you had sex. Early sex memories as I want. You can write in to no effin regrets podcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's no effin regrets podcast. Or you can comment in the YouTube if you feel like going public with it. Of course, I will read these out on the next episode. But uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. I don't remember any particulars. On, although I do remember one time I was with this one girl and we went, it was so fucking hot. We went to, uh, we went to a graveyard to go have sex. And I was like, yeah, this is fucking so metal. And uh, we go there, and she was fucking blasting. She had a nice car. She was blasting Merciful Fate. And we're like, fuck it, we're fucking on a gravestone. <laughs> this is so bad. And, uh, like, we're fucking up against the gravestone. And, like, I can't remember exactly how we were doing. Like, we might have been sitting, like, she might have been sitting on me, and I was leaning up against it. And then, like, we ended up knocking, like, the top, like the top part like knocked off and we were like, holy shit. Like we freaked out and then we laughed and we're like, Oh my God. And like, and so if anyone that I love, if I ever go to their grave and it's, you know, their headstones knocked off, I'm going to be like, Oh, well, yeah, like, I deserve that, I guess. <laughs> but yes, sex to merciful fate in a graveyard was pretty fucking hot. It's pretty fucking awesome. It's a great, memory hammer we're fucking drinking wine wine coolers california coolers which are like lime and white wine and sugar but uh yeah it was good it was good times it's a good memory it's a fond memory and uh yeah fond memory i have to say what else did i write down here I, i take some notes now i'm a fucking professional look at this i take fucking notes now my podcast intro I take notes for. Yeah, that's I'm fucking professional, god damn it. I uh I think I've been telling I've been telling everybody that uh in the last couple weeks unfortunately arguing with my sugar pie, you know, we've been kind of bickering and arguing and you know, I couldn't figure out why I'm just like, oh, I said this in the last week's podcast. I was like it's so fucking stupid why we're doing that like our life is really good like we have nothing to argue about and uh you know and i say that because i feel like you need to say those things out loud like you need to you know i think it's very easy in today's society to always look at the negative and never see the positive and never acknowledge the positive and be like you know our fucking life's pretty fucking good and it could be way worse bro but uh we got into it again this weekend, this last weekend. And I was just like, what the fuck? And, you know, we do our little date night Friday and Saturday. And I was just like, you know, she was just like, it was pretty early. She's like, I'm going to go and watch TV. I was like, I, what the, f-? like, I don't want to watch TV. Like we, you know, date night for the last year and a half has been us kicking it until we're both drunk. And then we go eat some food. And when we go to bed, like that, why are we watching TV? Like, I don't want to, I can fucking watch TV anytime. And we started arguing about that. We just started arguing and, and, uh, you know, I kind of all exploded from there, like a totally dumb reason to start arguing, right? Like dumbest reason ever to fucking argue, but we did. And, you know, out of it came, kind of a revelation, I think, for both of us. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go too much into it because it's, you know, it's our private business. But, you know, a lot of it comes down to uh, the tour we just announced. We just announced a tour. We're going on tour in September, end of August, really, September and uh, and October. And... You know, it's it's wearing on her. And, you know, this has been an ongoing problem in our relationship for 27 plus years because every time I go on tour, it's like, it's it's hard. You know, she's basically a stay at, you know, she's a single parent, you know, and granted, my finances are helping stuff, but I, I'm gone. And she's alone and then, you know, like, we've talked her and I have talked about this before when we've argued that like whenever I get ready to go on to like, it's for, for me, I'm like the opposite of her. Like when I know I'm going on tour in the weeks leading up to going on tour, all I want to do is hug her 
and kiss her and smother her, like and have sex and like I'm gonna be gone for all these all this time. I want to get it all in before I go because then once I'm gone, like it's just me jerking off for the next nine weeks. You know, so I'm like with her, and I think with a lot of women, it's the opposite. It's like she is putting up her wall so she doesn't have to feel lonely and she knows she's going to be lonely. She knows she's going to miss me. So in order not to feel anything, she just kind of shuts down, doesn't want to kiss, doesn't want to hug, doesn't want to have sex. And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on, dude? And I'm, you know, granted I'm not going on tour for 10 months, but you know, it was, uh, you know, me saying about how, I'm going on, you know, how over the pandemic that we, you know, that we were just super connected. And she's like, I feel like it's, you know, like we were crying and, we're, you know, arguing and finally got to the, the, to the crux of it all. And it's that, you know, she's like, I had you for myself. Like I was, you know, I was just home. There was no chance of me going on tour when the pandemic was going, there was no chance of me leaving. And now that she knows it's happening, that, you know, it's like, it's fucking her up. And, you know, she's, you know, she kind of just realized it all at that, in that moment. And I realized it in that moment. And, you know, cause it kind of coincided with the tour announce. And I was like, wow, like, you know, there's a, there is a price that is paid, you know, for me, uh, being gone on tour, it's, it's awesome. And I love being on tour and look, this is the only fucking thing I'm goddamn qualified to do at this point. But, uh, there's a price, you know, there's a price and, you know, she pays it, my family pays it. And, and uh, yeah, it kind of tripped me out and, you know, I don't know how long this is going to last. You know, I, I'm you know, I'm getting up there in my, I'm no spring chicken, as you can tell by this fucking beard right here. And, uh, I don't know how long this is going to last. And, you know, I'd love to bring her on tour, but you know, as long as we got the kids, they got to be in school. And, you know, in the last 17 years has been really, she's only been on tour. She's been on tour maybe once in 17 years, you know, cause just the kids. And, and if she does come, it's only for like two days or three days or something. And then, and, uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been a hard, it's a hard, you know, the, all the things that you never think about when you're in a band and you know, when you join a band or you start a band, but, uh, I don't know. We've been getting along a lot better and I'm happy about that. Cause it was really, really wearing on me. I was just couldn't figure out why we were, I was like, this is so stupid. Like, what are we fucking fighting about? This is ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it happens. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Like men or women, if you're listening to that, I'm sure you know that this shit happens. Different circumstances for you, but it, that's, it happens. And it's no different for me. But, uh, yeah, we're going good now. We're actually like, you know, more connected and kind of helps to figure it all out. Uh, excuse me. Back to KK Downing, though. I just want to let you know how you don't even know how what a special moment this was for me. And I tried to I tried to keep it cool with him. And I did keep it cool with him, but and it was a great conversation. God, he's just fucking awesome. But this was like this was a dream come true shit right here. I can tell you right now, like KK Downing, like I play a flying V because of KK Downing. Like, I stared at the cover of Unleashed in the East for hours out of my life. Probably wasted 24 hours of my life staring at that fucking album cover going, that is the fucking raddest band, and he's got the coolest guitar. And, you know, and I'm just like, I wanted to play a Flying V because of that. And that's why I do. You know, he was just cool, and the fucking studs, and the... Like, the crazy fucking lead style, and... Dude... Major, major influence. Judas Priest, major influence. And, uh, you know, just, just literally shit that I never, ever thought that I'd do. 
and it was such an honor and it was so humbling and it was so, um, it was just a fucking fantastic, like I could, like if I could have written the script to this interview, like I couldn't have written anything better. It was so fucking just everything that I hoped it would be. It was, and he's a, he's a fucking legend, man. Like this dude is a king among kings and uh, I'm really excited for this. So, uh, but I'm going to play you right now. I'm not going to play you any Judas Priest because I know for a fact it's going to get some copyright strikes and I'm not going to deal with that after the Twisted Sister one because that was a fucking mess. So, but I will play you the new stuff that he's got. And uh, I tell you what, man, his new record's got some bangers on it. This song being maybe the bangerest of the bangers, dude. This is Return of the Sentinel. Check this shit out. Nine minutes. Nine minute epic. on the vocals, which is the uh, later day Judas Priest singer after uh, after uh, Halford left. This is the number one song on Spotify right now. We had a killer first week for the record too. The record did really good. So that's some that's some shit right there. So set so Judas Priesty. This is the first single, Hellfire Thunderbolt. That's my that's the KK shit right there. What do you think Slayer got it from? Worshipping that KK Downing shit. And that's no joke right there. I can't do that shit. All double bass. This is a uh, this is the title track, Sermons of the Sinner, Sermon, Sermons of the Sinner. That's some omen shit right there.
There you go. The new album, KK's Priest. This is the title track you're listening to. Sermons of the Sinner, out now, everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, the mighty, mighty, mighty KK Downing. KK Downing. Rob Flynn, great to see you again, sir. How are you, man? Very good, I think, mate, and yourself. I'm I'm stoked, dude. I'm really, really good. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much for having me on this uh, podcast. I've heard quite a bit about it. I'm a bit jealous, though. I don't have the background that uh, that our friend did, <laughs> the Caribbean. Um, right. right. But, uh, oh, uh, yeah, D. Snyder, the pretty, D. Snyder that one. Pretty, that was pretty cool. That was pretty good. Good yeah. to, uh, good to you can actually it. do that on Zoom. You can actually just take that picture and then just stick it back there. There's some way to do that. I don't know. Yeah, how. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was very cool. I just missed him at Bloodstock when I did the thing with Ross the Boss there because uh, he went on after me. So I, I guess he was uh, getting his pants on and getting ready to go out there and rock. So uh, Right on. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a great – that was a great one. He was so funny. Like, God, yeah, man, yeah. he's a yeah. character. Yeah, he has some stories to tell. I guess we all do, though, you know, so... Uh, did you ever cross paths, like, back in... Did you guys ever tour together, or just, like, festivals, or...? Uh, yeah, you know, here and there, we were kind of in the record plant together. That was pretty crazy times, you know, uh, just before that closed down, you know, and... Um, what what yeah. album would that, what album would that have been? I think, I think that was during... Um, would be um would it be the turbo album well anyway it was going back right right uh, into the 80s i guess into the the glory days you know the it's... wonderful 80s you know that we remember so so fondly you know when uh when things when rock was was uh was great yeah and it still is it still is but some funky things obviously but we you know we're hanging in there yeah yeah, I see you're coming. You're coming to the UK uh, yes. next September, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. saw the day, so it's going to be great. I think my nearest one's going to be Nottingham Arena. That's a great, great arena. That's not too far from me. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, come I'll out. Chug up, sure. I'll, I'll chug up there with uh, AJ, my uh, newfound guitar player. You know AJ. A, yeah, AJ from Hostile, right? They opened for us yeah. on some some of those warm up dates we did. Yeah, they did a tour. They, he never stopped talking about that too you know because he's uh obviously a massive fan as well so uh, he's a ripper dude yeah he's yeah a ripper <laughs> i gotta say i gotta give you i gotta give you huge props man i've been listening to your new record and it is metal as fuck dude it's so good it's really really good man like it's so aggressive and up tempo and epic like these epic you know the choirs and that like it's it's really, really good. You should be extremely proud. Yeah, I'm really, well, we're all really pleased with the record, you know. Um, it is what it is, you know, coming from a, a guy of my age, you know. Um, obviously, it's got connections with probably every decade. Yeah. Of, uh, you know, and I kind of wanted that really, Rob. I like that, you know, to, to, to just have that attachment, you know, with my uh, long-lived legacy, really, of many decades, you know, because it's been fun and good times. And so I wanted to bring some of that flavor, you know, into the present, you know, and take it into the future. And um, I think that's good because I think you have to, you have to keep a hold of what, what you had and cherish, you know, I mean, it's like you guys like with burn my eyes, you know, with that, I mean, you know, you could never ever see yourself losing an attachment, not just with that album, but the period of time, it was very, very prolific and important to you, as was obviously the 70s and then even the 60s one myself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, all has a great, uh, the history is, uh, it's so valuable, you know, to us all, because yeah. it's all about memories is all we have of our past life, so to keep a hold of it, it's a good feeling, really, you know. You know the thing, though, that I was, when I was listening to it, and, and I do totally agree with you that it does touch on many uh, 
eras of of your musical writing but but it still has this forward thinking very modern sounding metal and I, I have always admired that about you know you guys and you as an artist you oh. know that you guys manage to do what I think is one of the hardest things in in music is evolve and you know still grow with the times keep the essence of what you are but you know like your metal is fucked to the fucking day you die but still incorporate all that you know kind of new stuff and you know you i think you did it on albums like painkiller you did it on you know and even now i think you're still doing that and that's amazing yeah thanks for that and um i know exactly what you're saying because you know when you live a life for so many decades and you have to be creative i'm sure you can relate with this rob there's times when you can actually doubt yourself and and doubt the band and you know and there's there's times when little bits of insecurity can creep in you know because you know because you've got new bands coming all of the time and you know at you you know and um and you've got to i suppose this is uh just a, a suggestion for lots of bands really just hang on to yourself and who you are and what you are and believe in it you know because you got you get so far and you're successful but the fans are there and they never let it go you know they'll stay they'll stay with you if you can stay with yourself you know so you just have to keep doing that and and so when i came to put this record together i kind of just switched on to autopilot and thought don't let any outside influences creep in you know because um i i don't care if i like something and um and it sounds good to me then i should just go ahead and do it and not worry whether other people think oh it's old-fashioned it's been done before it's this it's that you know just don't just just let, just forget that if you like it, you know, and um, and the thing is, if you can come through that, what you end up with is something that somebody will appreciate. Definitely the fans that have been with you for so long, they think, yeah, you know, um, hopefully that, you know, KK is, is true blue, he sticks to his, you know, what he believes in. And, it, and that's exactly what you want to do anyway, right. where... In the past, sometimes you do get let outside influences creep in and affect what you do naturally and who you naturally are. If any of that makes any sense, Rob, yeah. you know, if you can relate to that, because, you know, Machine Head's been around there for, you know, um, a long time. Yeah. I can remember, I can remember I was in Birmingham, you know, Birmingham, you've been there a million times. And uh, yeah, I walked into HMV, the record store, and I was in there. And I was out there shopping for something else, you know, uh, probably looking for boots to wear on stage. Or something. <laughs> and I'll just pop in there and have a work through. And then I saw you on this television because in the old days, I don't know if they still do have television. Oh, right. They'd play like uh, a video in the store. And they played the video and you were there with the video. And I'm thinking, oh, what the fuck is this? You know, this is new. Who's this guy? You know, and it was like the long hair but the attitude of like kind of this new metal or or, or metal that was, was like hardcore more like metal on metal yeah like it was hard new metal didn't exist at that point <laughs> i'm thinking because i'm that type of guy you know it just matters something attracts i'm thinking who's this why do i like this you know and um and straight away, obviously, I bought the record, you know, played it, and it was a cassette, I think. Nice. I'm going to get the cassette because I got the cassette in the car, you know. And you, know, uh, you probably don't have a CD player in the car at this point. <laughs> and um, and uh, I didn't have the CD, but I got the cassette in there, and um, and yeah, and so, uh, and obviously, uh, an immense record. And, uh, and still to this day, I'm thinking, why did I like that? Why, why was that such a big album? And it was just about attitude on top of attitude, you know, metal on metal. And, uh, and it was fresh sounding, really. We were just coming off the painkiller. I think it was 94, wasn't it? Right. 
right. not before the album mm -hmm. actually uh, came out. So we were in that limbo period between Painkiller when Rob left. Um, oh, right. And, right. Uh, and, uh, and us getting Ripper, you know, to get going again. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was great. But at least I had uh, a good album to, to wear out, you know, yeah. on the cassette machine. The Thank car. you so much, man. That's I've never heard this story before. That's really cool. No. <laughs> That's really awesome. Yeah. And we've hung we've hung out a few times. I remember you came, you caught us on that tour. I remember you came to the Birmingham show, and about like a year later or something. And uh, and I felt bad. I didn't recognize you when you walked in because you had you were wearing a bolero hat, <laughs> and it just KK Downing in my mind's eye did not wear a bolero hat. So I was like, I probably yeah, I did. Yeah, I was just like, yeah. I, I was like, well, who is this guy? And like my drummer's like, it's KK Downing, and I was like, oh shit. I, like, yeah, it was it was a bit like a bit of a fedora, similar to. Right, right. Uh, oh, maybe it was yeah, a fedora. I, okay, right. I used to wear. It, right. You know, no, I remember this now. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Nineteen seventy-three, something like right. that. But this is right. a bit more of a modern, all-weather version. You know what I mean? Right. right. Um, combating the shitty weather in England. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. that was great. And then I and then I remember we hung out again. We hung out for a while at the, after the one of the Kerrang Awards. And I think it was, you guys won something, I think you won like a Lifetime Achievement Award or something, right? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, but anyway. I, I remember coming to see you in Wolverhampton at the, um, at the gig there on that tour, Burn My Eyes tour. Yeah, I think that was the one where you had the fedora yeah, yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, well, yeah, probably was, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I remember that. That was um, that was a great gig, great sound, you know. Thanks. And you had uh, some good. Uh, I think Mary Beach Jane and um, yes. yeah. Mashuga. Yeah, Mashuga. Yeah. So great... the... What's that? So it was a great bill, you know. It was a great bill, and, and of course you came out and uh, Mashuga yeah. on their first tour. We took them on their first tour. You know, yeah, yeah. They just had it the was, EP uh... out at that point, and I was freaking yeah. out on that EP. Yeah, yeah, because I only just found out, I think, the, literally the day before that that gig was on. So uh, I just necked it up there, yeah. We hung out again at the Kerrang Awards, though, and we went, we all went to the after party, and it was you, me, and Glenn, and I think my guitar player, Phil, and we were do we did a shit ton of shots, Jaeger shots. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you remember this, but, like, they just kept on coming around, delivering them, and we just kept yeah. on drinking them. And, yeah, well... Uh, I remember with, you, did, um, you tell, did tell me a really funny story about um, uh, that Les Binks had written some of Beyond the Realms of Death. Yeah. That he wrote like the verses or something like that. And it blew my mind. I was like, what? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was yeah. asking you about that. Is that, is that true? Like Les Binks, yeah, the drummer. Yeah, I remember. We were in kind of um, a little recording studio in Birmingham. And we were, I think we were rehearsing the songs for a, an album that we we're going to do. And Les says, oh, yeah, I've, I've got an idea for a song. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but Les turned the guitar upside down, something like that. You know, was Les left-handed? He wasn't left-handed, was it? But anyway, something was a bit weird about it. You know, um, it did something something weird. Um, but and, and, he, and he played the verse, and I'm thinking, Oh, that's pretty cool, you know. And so, you know, um, yeah, and I think it actually made it onto the record, which was, which is really good. So, yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to uh, Leslie's going to be joining us on on stage uh, as many, yeah, uh, as many gigs as he can. So that's going to be great to be able to that's play amazing. some of that old old stuff again. You know, has he uh, been, has he been out of the mix that whole time since? I guess before yeah. British Steel, like he hasn't has well, he been playing in bands or? Yeah, well, Les was always a, Les was a session mu uh, musician. Oh, you know, okay. A, a very successful session musician in uh, in London. I mean, he did sessions with the Who when he was a teenager and oh, stuff wow. like that. You know, holy. And shit. so I think together, Les and Simon Phillips became the two guys that were kind of all rounders. By that, I mean that they could play with anybody, you know, metal bands, you know, where most session musicians will steer away probably from the, the heavier stuff. But Les and Simon thought, well, you know, they were, they were kind of uh, 
So I think that that was kind of uh, good for them, a good accolade for them to have, to just be able to sit on the drum stool with any band that came along. And of course, when Simon, uh, we wanted Simon to do the tour, but he, he said no, because I, I think those guys predominantly like that scene, that city scene with playing with lots of different artists with lots of different styles of music, you know, fusion and stuff like that. Um, but I think Les thought, you know, I'll give this a go. I'll travel around and do a couple of tours with a band. But it wasn't really his thing, you know. It wasn't really his thing. Yeah. Uh, but he we always, enjoyed it. We enjoyed it immensely. And we played a lot of big shows and did a lot of things, you know. Um, but I think when when it finished with Les, he went back to doing just what, he's, what he was comfortable doing, you know. And... Um, but yeah, Les is definitely up. He would have done this for sure, but like say, Les was able to play, but not for long periods of time, Rob. You know, it's like when you're putting drums down in a studio. Right, right. You know, it's like sometimes all day long, you know. Um, so I think Les just didn't want to make uh, whatever issues he had um, a permanent situation, you know. Right. So uh, he said, oh, I hand the sticks over to some some young blood so we got sean from san diego and he's kick ass yeah. and um uh, so really happy with the lineup um looking forward to getting out there and is that uh, who did less record the record or did sean record the no, record? yeah no no because of the 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 endurance test of laying down tracks you know yeah and you got the guitar players go no it's not good enough do it again i right. want more take you know <laughs> right. so yeah, your uh, uh, your drummer's ripping, you know, like he's. I mean, right from the get go, you know, the the Hellfire yeah. Thunderbolt. I mean, it's just like the fast <laughs> double bass, and it's it's awesome. Like it's really yeah. Be uh, look forward to us being on the same bill at some point, whether it's festivals or not. You know, yeah, totally. And uh, you mentioned the Jaegers. You know, do I remember that? I could, the thing is with Jaegers, you always remember doing them. You never remember how many you did. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Right. You're walking into walls after a while, just <laughs> like what? And so uh yeah, I often tell the story about Kerry King, you know, you can't get you can't walk past the bar if Kerry's there and spots you, you know. Um, you know, he's such a lovely guy, you know. He Come is. on. He man. loves that fuck he loves the fucking Jaeger. I'm like, yeah, I'm you're a again. Before, I'm like okay. Before you know you've done three Jaegers before you can either even, you know, order a beer. So right. Right. Yeah, but uh, he's uh, he's a lovely guy, as you know. You know, I wanted you to tell me about um, talk to me about the uh, the second song, the Sermon of the Sin, the title track. Yeah, and this is really like it's a dude. This is like a straight up metal anthem rager. Like it's so epic and it's so grand, and you guys incorporated so many cool things into the mix, mm -hmm. and it sounds so you like it just sounds like you it's it, it's crazy you know like even the feel of it like the playing and the lead style and like yeah and I really have to commend you on this particular song and i could see why you gave it the title to the album but you know tell me tell me about this one because it's i think it's really yeah, a special well, song i think that the, the, that particular song has probably got so many different ingredients in respect of messages emotions you know um there's so much in there, really, Rob, you know. Um, but essentially, it's probably a little bit of, it's a little bit of a biography about me, really. I was a young kid when I started. I went all through the whole thing. But now it seems like um, it's not just, you know, myself, obviously, um, having just gone 70, you know, um, you, you start to feel vulnerable. And uh, and the fact that we're losing so many friends along the way, Rob, you know, um, people are, uh, are passing away, which is very sad. Um, but it just brings about the awareness, you know, that this particular music that I was a part of, you know, um, the whole evolution, you know, um, from the 60s all the way through, it's so dear to my heart that, you know, I would like to see it... Um, sustain itself as much as uh, uh, as possible, you know, into the future and not just become a page 
in the in the history books, you know, something that you have to read. You know, I would like our um, you know people uh, that follow us in our footsteps and uh, and fans as well to be able to continue to to hear you know this type of music you know and um, and I'll call it you know whatever you want to call it rock hard rock heavy rock you know classic rock you know true metal heavy metal whatever it is because I was a part of all of that you know right. for so many decades and it's a part of my legacy and um, and uh, if people say oh no it's done with it's over as much as obviously there's lots of great new metal you know and things are progressing that's great too um, but for for bands and musicians of our age but also younger musicians there's still a lot of validity I think um, in this style of music and that's what the album sermons of the sinner is kind of there for as kind of still a today you know a kind of benchmark and a statement saying that if you like this music then you it's fine to 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 look to try to write and create you know this music as well because if you think it's all been done said and done well sermons of the, of the sinner hopefully still has some new fresh ingredients and some new energy you know that makes this style of music still valid valid you know today in um in this year if all of that kind of makes sense but at the same time bringing about awareness us dinosaurs you know will become extinct one day and fall off the edge of the earth you know but while we're still here albeit fragmented hopefully we can bring some good ingredients you know that you still think that um that has a good value to to listen to and to go and watch us play live as well yeah if that makes sense because it's kind of heed the warning like the narrative says at the beginning and that is my voice actually i did narrate that oh is it oh, okay yeah. great awesome <laughs> i was thinking that i was like is this kk i can't tell like, yeah yeah that, that's it's all it. tuned down and evil <laughs> and uh, so i heed the warning you know as time is running out so the whole thing is a big message it's a big sermon and the reason i call the song sermons is because they're actually more than just songs uh, they're really quite poignant and meaningful, you know, and uh, and that helped me to to compose the songs and put them together so quickly and efficiently, um, and it was very enjoyable to do, you know, and um, and the fact for the first time, you know, I was a since the uh, late sixties and early seventies, you know, I was able to be kind of um, the, the overseer of, of what was acceptable and what wasn't mm -hmm. without, you know, a collaboration because I was locked away in lockdown. You know, I was on my own. It was Christmas 2020. And I'm thinking, right, I either spring clean the house because <laughs> I'm in between girlfriends, whatever that means. <laughs> well, and, um, you know, and, um, and so it's me down to me or i'll either do that or write an album and so i thought forget the spring yeah, cleaning. Fuck the cleaning <laughs> i'm going to put an album together so that's what i did and it was tremendously enjoyable to be honest you know i was i enjoyed doing it and um and some of the songs i just wanted to turn the clock back whatever people say you know some of the songs you can relate to them you know um you know like the gong ho songs the parking lot songs, you know what I'm yeah. talking about. Raise Rob. your fists, yeah. yeah raise yeah, your yeah. fists, Brothers of the Road, right. Walden Free. See, it, it connects with another thing coming, living after midnight, totally. totally. and out to the highway, you know, that type of thing. But also, um, one of these songs, we ain't going to take it, you know, or Alice Cooper, School's Out, you know, these songs that I'm so familiar with that have been a part, you know, uh, that was so prolific in the 80s, you know, um, you know, I still think that that a lot of people might say things about these songs on a record. But when we come to play the things live, just like just like Tristy's sister, 
when they came on after us at Bloodstock, all hell let loose, you know. Right. They had the audience in the palm of their hands with these songs that go back, you know, and lots of people call them, you know, um, you know, more basic rock or whatever, but they're, they're songs that really connected hard and heavy sure. with the audience back then, sure. and it, they still do today. So I'm hoping uh, these songs off Sermons of the Sinner, when we get to kick them out live, yeah. then it's going to have that same effect. And I, you know what, Rob? But I think that they will, you know, I think because they're songs that will have an, an easy automatic connection with the fans, you know. I think too, like, you know, even like you're talking about Twisted Sister and I saw them back in the day, you know, they were a lot heavier than those pop songs. Now those songs were big and huge and they were great songs, but they were so much more of like a hard band you know raised like they're playing like biker bars and stuff like they were tough on stage like <laughs> you know like yeah yeah it was, they, and it was great you know that's it kind of helps that and they and they bring that and I, i'm sure you would i think that's great i mean it was a really smart move of you to get tim ripper owens for sure i mean it's a it's a familiar connection to the fans and he's yeah. fucking awesome i saw you guys on that tour when you guys played the fillmore in san francisco with tim and you know we had, we hung out after that, but fucking dude, he killed it. Like he fucking killed it, and he's still yeah. killing it on the new record. Yeah, he's great to play with because you know he's he's not gonna miss it. He's gonna nail everything. You know, even when he gets off a long haul flight and his throat's you know not a hundred percent, he still goes out there and sounds incredible. You know, he's so strong. Um, but yeah, it's good to have. You know, it's kind of, um, it's pretty comforting, I must say, you know. Um, I was disappointed that Les couldn't, couldn't make it with us, but um, to have Tim there, you know, and... Uh, it's a connection. Uh, it's good to have some younger blood in the band. Totally. Rob, you know, sure. I think that that's important because this is what this album's about as well, you know. We guys are going to hand over the baton, you know, uh, and it's the same with yourself. Somebody has to follow in the steps of, you know, bands like yourself, you know, and Megadeth and, you know, um, great bands of the era as well. You know, you will, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty da daunting. I think a lot of musicians think, oh, yeah, there's only one machine head. And that's right. true. Right. But the thing is, you've got to go for it, haven't you, Rob? You know, because yeah. you can't say there's only one, you know, Rob Flynn, one KK Downing, there's only one Judas Priest, one machine head. You know, you've got to go for it, you know, um, and, and stick to your guns, you know. If that's a main influence of yours, and you know, obviously, you can't be a carb carbon copy, but if you keep going at it, eventually you will find your own identity, as lots of bands have in the past. Yeah, Judas Priest is one of those bands. We we didn't really find our identity probably till British Steel. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we were quite a successful band before that. But it didn't all click until the leather and the studs, British Steel, the album, right. the razor blade, everything, you know. And um, and it's been like that for a lot of bands, you know, that I've noticed. And and suddenly it all comes together and you become your own identity. But you have to have those influences there, critically important, because yeah. they will keep you driving forward, you know, just to want to be, have some of that, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think having, it's, it's gotta be really exciting to have some young blood and playing with some younger guys, you know, AJ and your drummer and your bass player, like it, it yeah. fires you up, right? Like it makes you, you know, I'm not saying it makes you feel young, but like it gives you that young energy and you can connect with that. Like, you know, people think that because you get old, like you can't remember what it's like, like you remember what it's like when you were 20 years old, you know, like, and you can, can reconnect with that feeling and that spirit and that fire absolutely and um obviously it's uh you know the, the guys are so happy and feel so good about the whole thing um and i think that we'll get uh 
I'm already well stuck into the next record. You oh, know, shit. So, wow. Awesome. So hopefully that will come out next year as well. Cool. And, um, and let's just hope we can just uh, get out on tour. Um, it's really encouraging to see that you're coming out, you know, uh, next year. We, we're kind of going to be a little bit at the back of the queue because there's so many bands trying to fulfill their obligations lot, yeah, for the past traffic. couple of years, you know. And um, so we understand that, you know, we might not get a, you know, a real good go at it. But we'll see. It just depends. Let's hope they can produce the, the magic pill. Apparently, this COVID thing, now there are pills now available. I know. I heard uh, about that. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty- yeah. I think that, that I think that they're becoming available now in the UK. That's awesome. So hopefully, yeah. that, that's pretty good. It just needs something simple to turn it around, Rob. And I think that we'll catch up pretty quickly, I think, you know. So that would be really good. How long did, how long was Ripper in the band for in Judas Priest? Was it about 10 years? Well, well we did two, we did two albums and two tours, but it was close to eight years, I think. Okay, you know? yeah. So it was a good stretch. Yeah, yeah I mean that's a lot stretch. of that's a that must feel good to have you know a musical connection as you're going into this with somebody. Yeah, not like a new I, like a new guy might feel weird. Yeah, I, I secretively secretively really did uh, fancy hearing Ripper singing songs like this on the new album, you know, on Sermons of the Sinner which is a bit more kind of classical, kind of metal in a way. You know, I really wanted to hear him sing this stuff because I really did think that it would be very, very befitting of him, you know. And uh, I, I think I was right, really. I like to hear him sing this stuff, you know. Were you guys um, together writing and recording or was this ton kind of like... No, no, we were separated. We were separated. Yep. Cool. Um, because... Um, we did, I did a couple of shows in, uh, November, I think it was 2019, played with Ripper and Dave Ellison and did that. And that kind of got me thinking a little bit really. And so. Was that your first show and was that your first time on stage and yeah, Priest? I I did, I did some songs with Ross the Boss at Bloodstock Festival, which was a load of fun. I enjoyed that immensely. Um. All of this came about under duress because people say, well, you just play a couple of songs and then <laughs> one thing leads to another, you know, then awesome. you put a whole set together. And uh, But Christmas came about very quickly. And I get a bit bored at Christmas, like I say, do the housework or make an album. So I did an album. But I, I decided, I think, I don't want to put a band together and decide then we've got no material, you know, I have to sit around for a year. But, so I thought, I'll just sit down and see what happens and I just enjoyed it immensely and because I was on my own so I got stuck into the lyrics and the melody lines and and everything you know oh yeah okay cool wow yeah so um because I just wanted to hear the songs because the music is one thing as you know um you know but you know it's cool for you because you're the, the a vocalist and obviously lyric writer as well but you know, so I just wanted to hear the, the songs how I could hear them because I had the um, I had the titles and 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 the uh, chorus deliveries and stuff like that, and so I wanted to develop them um, because you know often Rob we can write music but it's it's kind of tough to put vocals over it. Uh, sometimes you can make the music a bit too complicated, so. Uh, and it makes it more difficult to harmonize. So you have to have more kind of um, kind of extrovert. To so are you just hearing it. these in your head or are you actually singing the melodies? I'm, I'm singing them. Oh, I okay. Them. So you're demoing them yeah. out with you singing. Yeah, I sang, oh, okay. I sang, yeah, I sang them all as well. Rad. You know, That's awesome. and then my next step was to get AJ in because he could sing better than me. <laughs> to make halfway decent uh, demos so it wouldn't be embarrassing to play to rip it, you know. <laughs> Um, but awesome. it, uh, so that was kind of the process, you know, right, right. um, but I've kind of got a technique away that I come out with the most obvious to me, uh, melody line for the vocals. Yeah. And I'm thinking the most obvious one is going to be the, the strongest one, you know, right. um, so 
generally it has to work first time you know it has to really work first time if not i'll change the music to fit the oh, melody okay. Line. oh okay gotcha Quick, just quickly make some musical adjustment yeah yeah you know but but the melody line you know uh you know yourself you just might have to change a little bit of timing or just an odd chord here or there yeah uh, a little bit part of the riff and then to make it really sit and punctuate well yeah. there's some but great it, it, dude you have some great key changes on the record i mean it, just it, it, great it chord progressions and yeah it happened pretty pretty quickly really you know um so 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 that and I, it's quite enjoyable to do to know that it works i wanted to know mm -hmm. because these guys are going to be looking to looking to me having bit you know having written and co-written all of these all of these songs yeah you know to know are you that, programming uh, drums too are you doing the drums or is it just guitars yeah. and vocals? yeah okay so you've got yeah 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 i get pretty bored with that but you know obviously us guitar players and drum machines you know what we're like <laughs> the drummer's worst nightmare aren't we really <laughs> And I, so uh, I always hear the drums when I write a riff. So I'm like, I'm like, I got to tell. All right, this is how I want it to go. They're like, Ugh. yeah. And Guitar so player, I drum did, parts. <laughs> so and then and then obviously I delegated some of that to AJ as well. Put a drum because he's got pretty nifty fingers. I'll put a drum fill there and a drum fill there. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, um, so you got you've got like a little bit of a partnership. He must be close by or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he is. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's awesome. And, um, and then, you know, we, we were able to elaborate on the drum parts as well, you know, uh, for when Sean came in um, to do them. So, but I'm pretty fussy with the drums. I can hear the drums as well. Right. You know, you know where it's, you know where it's yeah, like. Totally. I can hear the drums as well. You know, I've, I've done a lot of programming, obviously. Judas Priest over the years as well with, with drum parts and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Guitar players do. And yeah. often often we'll we'll write songs around drum parts, you know, that you know. Um a lot of that was done on Nostradamus and even and uh, even songs like um, Bullet Train and stuff like that, different different drum parts, you know. You know, as guitar players, we've got our hands into everything, even bass intros and stuff like that. We do all of that, you know. <laughs> we just, you know, because these little motif and important things are very important for the song, aren't they? Yeah. You know, uh, like, for example, Love Bites wouldn't be Love Bites without the bass intro. Right. You know, so, you know, which is sort of something I did in it when we're uh, in the studio somewhere, you know. You know, I, I on a on a Judas Priest record, it always it pretty much always said, at least to my recollection, was uh, just Tipton Downing, Halford. Like that was the three, the song credits, right? But that's probably not like you know when I talk to like when I, when I I've quizzed Jeff Hanneman from Slayer, like what Slayer songs did you write right? Like what? And I'll be like, did you write Dead Skin Mask? He's like, yep. Did you write Angel of Death? Yep. Did you write Rain and Blood? You know, so like, even though the credit may have gone to other people, yeah. Is that, what What are the songs that like that you wrote in Judas Priest? Well, I think not to say that know, not to say that nobody else contributed, but like the ones yeah. where you were like, this is the, you know, the majority of it. You know, um, well, there's quite a um, there's quite a lot on the early albums, right? You know, songs like Savage and different. Things it's hard to remember all of them as Judas Rising stuff like that, right? Um, which was on a later album. You know, there's been a lot. What about of like Hell Bent for Leather or like albums like that? Yeah, um, I'd have to listen to. The, uh, I have to run through the song titles, um, but a lot of stuff. Um, obviously, I started writing in the late '60s with like Al Atkins when we were stuff like uh, well. Um, all of the stuff on the, the first album, the first album. Right. Was oh, written. right, right. The first album was written, really. And we were playing the songs live, like Victim of Changes, even though it was called something else. Right, you know, right. There was Caviar of Mess. There was One for the Road. There was Victim of Changes. Victim of Changes, like you, the intro and all the guitar, doo -doo 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 -doo, all that like stuff. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, you like, you you practically defined a genre 
doing that one song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so many bands have ripped off that one song, you know, <laughs> like just like because it's just one of the greatest songs in the history of metal. And, you know, I mean, when you're writing a song like Victim of Changes, do you go like, I'm on to something? Or are you just like, it's just more another song I've written? Yeah, you, you never know what you're writing, do you? We, we can only hope. It's like Sermons of the Sinner. I hope there's some classics on there, you know. And, uh, I, for example, when you were doing Burn Miles, you probably didn't realize, I mean, some of these songs are no. going to be etched in stone forever. No. And I often think we were, we about were going we to open Burn My Eyes with a totally different song. <laughs> We, yeah. we were gonna open it. We were gonna open "Burn My Eyes" with "Death Church," which is like number six or number seven on the record. And our producer Colin was just like, "Do not open the record with Death Church. It's got to be Davidian." I was like, "Really? Like, oh, okay, <laughs> all right." Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes you can get so close to it, Colin. You rob, you know. Right. Um, but, and you can really do that, you know. And you can make errors. You can make mistakes. Right. But, um, but I like to think now that well, I've got so many years on the clock that I can. <laughs> right. I've learned from my mistakes, you know. Um, it's like now I say I hear so many bands and the first five songs are all in the key of E, you know, and uh, you know, so right. you, you you learn these things. You need to mix the song keys up. You really do. You need to write songs in different keys. Yes. You know, right. and you I don't lost. don't believe that the just because E is the lowest note on your guitar, that it's going to be the heaviest key to write in. It's not true, you know. Um, so, I mean, F sharp can sound to be a really heavy key. Yeah. You know, if you, if you look at Foxy Lady by Jimi Hendrix, that riff there, it's so heavy, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, in F sharp. Um, you know, so it's just... Um, you know, each key, keys have a different character. And that's why you'll get Chopin, Chopin people, the classic uh, classic uh, people writing um, writing pieces, you know, uh, in B flat minor, for example. Why choose that key? It's not because it's the easiest key to play in, not even, uh, well, having said that, that's all the black keys on a piano, isn't it? Mm, I stand corrected. Yeah. I can't. I stand corrected, but um, it's pretty close to it. Um, but anyway, you know. Um, I do know what you're saying, though, dude. There's a lost art of, especially in metal. There's a lost art of key changes. There's a lost art of different. Like you're right. Everything yeah. is in. There's some records where like every single song starts yeah. in the same key and ends so, in the same yeah. key, and it's just it, crazy. It just, even though the tempos are different from right. one song to another, if it's the same key, I'm thinking this could be a different part of the first song, you know. So these are things that you do if you mentor young bands, you know, these are things that you need to do because you need to lift people up and bring them down, right. you know, not just with the tempos, but also with the key changes to add different flavors. And they do because because the flavors and the tonality of different keys, they, they do ha add a different character to your songs, you know. Um, so we, my time, when I write, when I write, it's absolutely got to happen. We've got to have a key. We've got to have some songs in A, E, F sharp, B, you know, right. and D, if you can make that one happen, right. you know. <laughs> And, um, you know, you, you want a, a combination um, to put the album together and it will sound more varied together with the different other flavors that you, you know, like the ballads, the mid tempos, the yep. gas, fast ones. You've got all of that, but mix the keys up is very, very important too, you know. And so I think these, these things for younger musicians, things that I've learned over the years, you know, uh, works for me anyway, you know, right, right, right. Other guys might do things differently. I was, uh, when I was researching you for the podcast, you know, I'm just kind of reading, you know, about the new stuff. And, uh, I stumbled upon an article that's that you said that Judas Priest's lawyer had sent you a threatening email or letter. I don't know what it was, but is that a, uh, I mean, nothing ever came of it. They're trying to get you to not have 
the word priest in your name? Is that right? I think that their claim was that irrespective of the name, I think I'll have to read the email again because it went to my record label and uh, also went to me, um, basically stating that I was trying to, what's the word that we, they were using, you know, kind of uh, basically um, portray myself as being being them or something. I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, uh, and that was never the case because, you know, um, quite clearly, um, KK's priest is KK's priest. And you can see that when I do things differently, it's, it's different. You know, the band's different, the imagery that surrounds it, you know. But basically, um, I, I wanted to keep the priest because I feel I have license to do that, Rob, you know, because I've always been a priest, you know, since the late 60s. Right. You know, and, and if those guys who I've never met can make money and call themselves a priest, you know, um, then I can do it too. You know, and um, I think I still have an awful lot to offer because the thing is, you know, the misinformation is that, oh, KK was retired from the band. He's retired to go and look after his golf course. Well, the thing is, in 2010, we were all retiring. We were all going to finish the band. Okay. It was just, I thought I was the only one that was opting out to do the farewell tour, the epitaph tour, you know, because that's what was going to happen. The idea was to find a fill-in for me, and it was going to happen. We were all added in writing that we were going to end the band. I didn't know they were going to continue for another 10 years, and I don't think that they did, you know. But I wasn't ready to finish my career under the terms that were being laid out to me. Okay. You know, I wanted my voice to be heard as loud as anybody else's, right. and because that wasn't happening. I went, fine, I'm not doing the farewell tour. But in my own mind, I'm thinking, well, if I don't finish it, it's not finished for me. And right. it's not. So here I am. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's been some kind of like, there was a first letter sent and a second letter sent and like, and I, and I read yeah, that yeah. and then I was just like, you know, like, that's a band dude. Like, you're like, fuck you. I quit. And then like the next day you're like, look, I'm not going like, to, I'm not, I'm not quitting. Like, well, well, yeah, how many so fucking times has every band done that? Like uh, every band, every band thousand done that. fucking bet times yeah. by I'm, every fucking member. You know, like, Rob left for like 14 years and right, right. he was invited back 14 right. years, you right. know? So why is he now telling me if I did retire, why, why won't he allow me to come back out of retirement? Right. And Ian, Ian's not been a songwriter, but he's happy to go on there and play all my songs and make money from it. But he won't allow me back in the band to do the same. So that doesn't really work. So something weird's going on. But anyway, it is what it is, right. Rob. So it's sad, really, that the guys decided to change history. Um, but, but I'm here. KK's Priest is here, and it's not going to go away yeah. um, because... This is very enjoyable to do, uh, to make music like this, and to to be to get to meet the fans again and say hello uh, and do everything. Um, like I say, I would always was for sure that I was going to be stepping back into that band, you know, because that's like you say, complete bands self combust and get back together, don't they? Yes, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think didn't Guns N' Roses do that and other bands, you know? Like, <laughs> a million you know, bands, yeah. And then they come back and they're bigger than ever, you know, playing stadiums, yeah. which is fantastic. And then there's so many bands that stick together that hate each other's guts, but just, you know, like it's so, you know profitable. It's like? it's so profitable for them that it's not, they just... Uh, we, we just become like him and her, him and her you know? It, you know it, it's a relationship and we have to endure it, you know, because idiosyncrasies and all of that creeping, you know, somebody just, you know, making a noise when slurping a, right. a beer or a Coke on the bush. You can be right, you bastard. I'm going to, I'm right. going to kill you. If you do that one more time, 
shut the fuck up. You know, it gets to be like that. Because it, get, it's it gets to be that thing where like, here's the garbage can on the bus, but then the person puts the garbage right next to the garbage can. And you're like, what the fuck, dude? Like it's the, it's six inches away, but like, it'll turn into the biggest argument. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's yeah. being on a bus. So, that's being a band. I'm, that's I'm, being gonna, a band. I'm just, I'm just going to get my head down for five minutes on the beach, you know what I mean? And the next thing you know, the, 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 the blood and thunder movie comes on, you know, and you're in, in, the, you're in the bunk, you know, and the vibrations of the right. gunfire. I'm thinking, guys, can we just tone it down a bit, you know? Right. Do you, what, what, uh, do, you have a, do you have a preferred bunk? Yeah. Yeah. What's your yeah. preferred what's your preferred bunk? Well, I like the one ideally that's really high up. Oh, but really? Okay. I'm always I'm always uh, I'm always scared of falling out of it. Right. You know, <laughs> totally. And you always, always live in fear because the buzz goes like this. Yeah. It's a long way down, you know. Yeah. So it's always a worry. So but sometimes But that's you know, the one you take that's the one you take anyway? I like the one that, for some reason, that's high up. I so, like, know. you go to the you go to the middle upper right or to the back upper right or I the go, back upper left. I go the first bunk on the left of the top. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, right. I, I don't I don't know why, but um, but there it is, you know. Um, but it is pretty scary when you think of the miles that you've done, you know, in those bunks, and it's like terrifying, really, to think about it. But I think. On the next tour, I'm not going to go for the higher one. I'm not. I know my bones are too brittle now, Rob. I don't think I would bounce as well, you know. <laughs> Especially after a few beers, you know, you exactly. Fall, fall out like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> right. You know. I remember being on tour with uh, Alexi from Children of Bodom, and that exact thing. He got super hammered when he had the top bunk and fell out and fucked up his arm shoulder and like I couldn't yeah say that he knows so. i've just got lucky i think when i think of all the miles i've done you know and uh and you know the bus can hit a deer in the middle of the night that's happened you know yeah you can hit ice and stuff like that you know um and obviously there has been some very tragic things that have happened obviously as we know you know and van buzzy so we have to be careful when you start touring back in the 70s what are you guys touring in? Like oh my England God. or Europe or like what? What? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just not a, a van, bus, right? It's not a, a van. Okay, gotcha. It's just a van, and you know what it's like. Um, you put a couple of old airplane seats in it, and you, and you just sleep sitting up like this, you know. Right. And wow. And that's what you do. You just sleep sitting up like. Like, uh, you know, you can't lay down. And then when you get a six-wheel vehicle, you can actually get in the back and sleep on the gear. And we did that too. Wow. You know, you, you clean your teeth in the snow in in Norway and or Germany and get into the back <laughs> of the bus. And um, and it was hell on earth, really. But this is the this is the price you pay. That's some road uh, dog shit right there. That is some yeah, road I, dog shit. <laughs> There. Yeah, because and we would sleep in like what you call the we call the motorway services. You call them the truck stops, I guess. You know. Okay, gotcha. I can, I can remember one night we were both, you know, because bands, other bands would be there. You'd pull into there to spend the night there, and you think, oh, there's so and so there. That's so and so's van over there. And the one night we parked up next to Thin Lizzy. Oh yeah. You no. Know, Nice. And because you go in there and you have eggs, beans and bacon, something like that will sustain you through the night. And you sit there and you're going like this, you know. And uh, and because we parked up next to Thin Lizzy and Phil had a raging tough ache, you know. You know and he kept waking up and go, oh, fuck me. You know, in his oh, Irish accent. A toothache? You know? Is that what you said? A raging yeah, toothache? So, <laughs> he, kept, he kept waking everybody up, you know. So we had to drive over to the side of the car park, you know. <laughs> And leave him to it, you know, because uh, Phil had a pet, he had a set of lungs on him, you know, because right. he was like a big guy, wasn't he, Phil? You know, had a set of lungs, you know, his great vocal lungs, and and, and, his, and he would scream out in the night, bless him, you know, with his raging toothache memories, you know. Did you catch? Did you catch Thin Lizzy back in the day? Like, did, yeah, like, we did. Yeah. We, 
Yeah, we did uh, an awful lot of shows together. We were oh, all okay. playing the same gigs and stuff like that, you know. And um, yeah, when they were a three piece, really, when they did. Uh, like Jailbreak uh, era? You know, we were whiskey in the jar and stuff like that, you know. You know before Jailbreak, when they were just oh, one okay. guitar player. Okay. One guitar player with Eric Bell, yeah. So we would do, you know, a lot of gigs, you know. And, what's, um, what's the is there a is there a band you know like w- one of the reasons I call this no fucking regrets the podcast is that I try and interview people who you know they they have this choice in life and they could go this way into like normal nine to five life where you have a steady job and security and then you could, or you could go this other way and have no security <laughs> no no but like, it's just kind of like a free-for-all and i'm i'm wondering was there like a was there a band or a show that you went to where it was like you're like that's what i gotta do like i have to do i have to be in a rock and roll band now yeah well um i make no secret about it. in 1967 i went and saw Jimi hendrix and that was just a life changer rob because wow. you know he'd just come to the the UK and he was fresh and he was literally on fire, you know, um, because quickly, well, say in the latter years, Jimi Hendrix, I mean, the great Hendrix, he just came and went in such a short space of time, right, you know, right. so much. But obviously lots of things got to him, you know, the management, the industry, the pressure, right. you know, and obviously everything that went with it, if it was, you know, drugs or whatever, things that happened, you know, but when in the early days, because I managed to see him like six times and uh, first couple of shows within two weeks of each other in 1967. And and he was so fresh and on fire and he was just a complete free spirit, you know. But these were the gigs where he went on stage and just destroyed everything. Right. You know, the audiences went crazy, you know, storming the stage. I was one of them. People oh shit! You stormed the stage at a Hendrix yeah, show. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's fucking right. Yeah. That's Everybody awesome. did, you know, because it was so electrifying and, and literally was a real experience. And I'm thinking, my God, this was just unreal. I mean, because the guy, and 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 so this is in my mind when I'm doing kind of uh, Hellfire Thunderbolt, for example, the intro on the video, you know, and I I remember seeing. Jimmy on stage and he's and uh, and he's got this super trooper follow spot on his back and he's turned towards his amp and he's turned them all onto full and he starts that vibrato thing for Foxy Lady you know and it's getting louder and louder and he turns it around and just goes into a shape and into the riff and I'm thinking my God it was the most incredible moment I can ever experience because there he was full colour, full life. Because Jimmy, he was the player and the performer. You right. know, he looked good, played good, sounded good, you know. And his performance, you know, he was the all in one, you know. And so I like to think I've taken something from that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I was so true blue, you know, I never, I played a couple of Hendrix in the 60s, I played a couple of covers, Spanish Castle Magic and stuff like that. But I'm thinking, I have got to, unfortunately, when he died, it was a massive, massive impact to me because I'd just seen him at the Isle of Wight, you know, in 1970. And it just happened. And it was such a shock that I kind of distanced myself. You know, it was hard to face up after all of this wonderful en- enjoyment and wonderful experiences listening to his music and seeing him live. Right. You know. I saw the two shows at Royal Albert Hall, got to get some autographs from him and stuff like that. Wow. And I was kind of in shock. I was kind of in shock, you know, but in a way, because I I was trying to become a a musician myself, the last thing I wanted to do was have to try to mimic him in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So... But consciously or subconsciously, he's always kind of been there in in me, you know. Yeah, no, and, I, can, I can see that. Like as you talk about this, 
Yeah. And I have had, sure. I have had, I have heard people call me, you know, one of the sons of Hendrix. Because obviously, I haven't been able to contain it hundred percent, you know. So I still like to do controlled <laughs> feedback and uncontrolled feedback. And I will do more of that now, you know, kind of in my own band, and I can do, you know, the more freedom to do, you know, to express myself even more now. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. But that magical moment, it's just a different thing, but it, it's kind of, it's, it, it fortifies everything about me, you know, to want to, to do this, you know, at my yeah. age and, and, keep, and keep going. And, and it makes me realise how exceptional that I'm still here, able to do it. And the great Jimi Hendrix, he's been gone now for so many years, decades, yeah. you know. <clears throat> Totally. It's so, so, so tragic, you know, and that's why I feel very, very important to so, so many other guys, you know, close friends, you know, um, that are not with us anymore, you know, um, from you know, some people, age, illness, but I mean, sadly, dying bag. I mean, when I think about these souls that are um, so precious to us all still, you know, um, that, and that we have to really respect and appreciate uh, and cherish the, the decades that, that when all of these wonderful and all of this was created yeah. and, yeah. and manifested itself into something very, very special, you know. Mm -hmm. but, and I don't think we should let any of it go yet, and we shouldn't. We should keep pushing forward, you know, and, and let's do that together. You know, you, me, you know, and and everybody else. You know, let's keep doing it. If it's everybody, to everybody that's played a part, and um, and the fans, you know, they're on the journey with us. So, um, and and that's a great thing. It's been a wonderful, long relationship that's that will always be there and yeah. will never be eroded, really, you know. You know what's amazing, too, like what I think you just said, um, and you're talking about the fans, and I think it's hard for certainly someone my age or younger, but you're talking about, you know, what a fan you are of Jimi Hendrix. You storm the stage. You get autographs from Jimi Hendrix at the Isle of Wight Festival. You know, like... It's, that that blows my mind, you know, and in and, 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 and in another way, it doesn't blow my mind because I'm like, you're a fan. Of course, you're a fan. You started in the same way that any of us started as a fucking crazed music fan, you know, to, and you want to just be close to these people. And then you went off and did your thing. And I think that that, you know, I think somewhere along the line, you know, like people stop thinking of you like that. You know, people stop yeah. thinking of KK yeah. Downing, the music but, fan. It's KK Downing from Judas yeah. Priest, big band. Yeah. But, but also the message in, uh, in the album, Sermons of the Sinner, also there's so much rejoicement to this wonderful music, you, yeah. you know. And, and I want to experience that when we play live, like metal through and through. I don't care what people yes. say. That's going to be just a great moment when we, can, when we can deliver that up. You know, uh, because the thing is, there's so many musicians in the audience, you know, and there's, and obviously there's fans on the stage of music, you know, so we are as one, and, and we've become even more and more as one uh, as the decades have traversed, you know, yeah. and, um, and that's what uh, I hope to uh, experience as soon as po we possibly can, really, you know. Yeah to get out there and to be as one with our audience. Do you have because, any tour dates set up? Is there any tour dates set up? Well, uh, that too, uh, we did pretty well in the, in the rock you chart. Did, the album, you did, man. You did really good, dude. Yeah. The album went to uh, number one in, um, in Japan, Finland, Sweden, number two in the UK. It's, it, it, it's done pretty good. It's, it's done awesome. really quite well. So, Congratulations. Uh, but they're talking to people in Brazil, people in Japan and stuff like that, you know. So I don't know where we can kick off first, Rob. It's a big worry about the insurance as well because 
I think that even the promoters are just a bit concerned about insurance because, you know, we just have to be very, very careful, mm-hmm. you know, um, that everybody's covered, you know. Right. Um, should anything happen untoward, you know, uh, you never know. But uh, but hopefully um, everything will rectify itself pretty soon. And hopefully next year to New Year, let's get back on track, you know, get Christmas and the New Year out the way, and let's motor forward and um, get you a new uh, girl, get you a new girlfriend on the road. <laughs> the, the good thing is, though, I get to go to more shows. You know, because you know, you know what it's like when you're busy with a band. It's hard to get out to shows, isn't right. it? You know, yeah, it, it's okay. hard when you've been working all day in the studio and doing stuff like that. You know, to you know, to travel out, but. But uh, have you have you always been single? Have you always been? You've never been married. Yeah, no, I've kind of made a mess of the whole thing, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got to take the blame, you know. I've got to because they can't all be wrong. Right. <laughs> you're just, the, so you're just the, I've got to be the common denominator. A ba- a ba- you're bachelor to yeah, you know, <laughs> bachelor maid, <laughs> bachelor. They can't, they can't all be wrong, you know. Right. Um, so, uh, I know, but like when you're in the '80s, like why would you want to be married, right? Like you're in the '80s and the height of Judas Priest fame. It's got to be yeah, just insane, it, you know. It was a bit like that, Rob. To be honest, you know, because it was hard to make a commitment when, you know, you go to the next town and you meet some nice girls, you know. Um, and so, and then, it, and then you get to a certain age, you know, and. Um, and uh, things change. <laughs> right. Things right. things change a lot, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah. So you know what I the, I read the uh, the Hal- Halford's publicist sent me their book because they were going to have him on the podcast and it still didn't happen yet. But there was a time where he's he's talking in his book about how you and Glenn and every like all the dudes are like just you know slaying the pussy <laughs> like just get, killing it out there and he's like going into like truck stops and getting blow jobs through the wall and i was like this is cr-, you know that that was a wild that was just wild to read yeah <laughs> you're like <laughs> well like i said it was just just you know i mean you know obviously we always knew rob was gay from from you know, Did you know from the get-go, like from the get-go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course, because the thing is, you know, back in the back in the days, you know, in the 60s and uh, uh, particularly the early 70s, you know, when everything was still kind of, you know, behind closed doors and stuff like that. But people like us, us, can I say younger rebels with a different outlook on everything, you know, I think... People like, would yeah. just, you know, people felt a bit more comfortable around us because we would hang around in groups and gangs. We would always know that that guy's different to us or that girl's right. different. It's a little you more know, androgynous but, then too, like yeah, early seventies. Well, yeah, I mean, because I look, I actually looked like a girl. I've got to, I, let's be honest. You <laughs> right. know, when I was like 17, 18, I had hair down to here. Right. You know, and. Um, I can remember being in a jukebox once in, in in a bar, and I must have been like eighteen. And and this big trucker came up behind, and he he put his, he put his hands underneath my arms to, to feel my boobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me, mate. <laughs> you know as best as I could. <laughs> and he went, oh, sorry, sorry, like that. I was thinking, you know, so he was, he was having a grope on what he thought was a girl. But, you know, I mean, every, like you say, everything was androgynous. And, uh, but yeah, it was, um, yeah, so. But you knew. Yeah, you, so, just, you just knew. It, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, nothing yeah, matters. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, the main thing is, um, obviously, to me, Rob, Rob being gay, apart from me, he had a great voice. I thought, oh, Rob's going to stay in the band from ever, forever. And he's obviously going to be theatrical. He's going to be. He's, he's going to be obviously articulate with words, and he was, you know, it was yeah. all of that, you know, sensitivities and, and all of that, um, the showmanship 
So all of these ingredients oh. was a great attribute to have as a front man, you know. Yeah. And I yeah. proved to be right. I, I felt it I felt it was just it was kind of just sad though, you know what I mean? And I don't mean like sad, pathetic. I mean like it was just sad. Like that 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 was even at the height of his uh I mean, you guys are playing arenas, you're massive all over MTV, millions of records, and, you know, he's kind of, did, were you guys aware that he was doing this kind of stuff? Like, you know, like, he was pretty open about it in his book. I mean, like, you knew. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, my eyes have seen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> My but, eyes have seen but, a lot. But, you know, I mean, even in, you know, in the mid-70s, if you come off stage and Rob's in the show with one of the crew and stuff doing things, I mean, it was just, it is what it is, you right, know. Right, You don't have to go in there until it's over and whatever. Right. right. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, because like I say, Rob had to put up with a lot of things from us, you know. Right. Didn't they? You know, it's the same thing. No difference. Right. Yeah. Like you know. he's coming in. Yeah. You guys are in the shower with a bunch of chicks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You right. know, fair is fair. Right. You know, we're, 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 we're all there in the van. We're ready to go. Okay. Where's fucking Dave? Okay. He's in there. He's in there. He's in there with a girl. Somebody go and get him. You know, right. so whether it was Rob in a truck stop or whether it was Dave still in the showers with a girl. Whatever, you know, we, we need to go. We need to get to the gig or from the gig, you know. <laughs> and you know, these things happen. It's, it's rock and roll. And um, like I say, you know, a lot of things were put down to rock and roll because it was rock and roll in those days. Yeah. I do. I always... Um... I always... I don't know what... I, I don't know what... What's the word I'm looking for? Not impressed, but I... I you guys... Your image in uh, the magazines was always very macho, heterosexual. You know, like I almost felt like it was overcompensating for, and I've even thought this as a kid, you know, because it's like there's Rob and he's got like a chick up and he's grinding up against a chick. And then there's a, there's a famous photo of like the whole band in a hotel room and there's like chicks all over and, you know, like really, really playing it up. And, and I, and in some ways I would imagine that like you kind of had to do that, you know, this is 40 years ago, like people weren't so okay with, you know, homosexuality like they are now, you know, maybe. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. was that more like from the label? Was that from the magazine? Was that from management? Like where? Um, I just think that um, Rob, were, Rob, in all fairness to, to Rob, Rob, Rob was a team player, you know. I mean, he knows that, that you know, his image and the way that he was in the day and everything, it, it appealed to guys, it appealed to girls, you know, and he was cool with that, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, if if I, the same with me, because your audience is your audience, you know, right. and we, we, we had, a, you know, so many people that did have an awareness, obviously, back in the day, but, you know, we're, we're entertainers and we're performers, you know, um, but a great belief in the music, you know, and the image and just everything around it. I still was, had, had immense pride in, in Rob, you know, as a great front man and entertainer and, and a great yes. vocalist. And he played the part, you know, as well, equally as we thought we did, you know, in the macho macho that was Judas Priest, you know, because right. we we done the outfit, the leather and the studs, and you know, and I think anything to do with anything else, ancillary sexuality or anything, was just not a part. It wasn't on the stage, you know. Right. Um, right. You know, in Rob's mind, maybe it was here and there, but to us, it was so ferocious and full on 
delivering yeah. up this music, you know, in the way that we did it, you know, it, to me, um, there was, I, I felt so proud of all of the bandmates, you know, because we'd done the uniform and it was unique at the time and it was such a good, uh, such a sense of, uh, such a powerful feeling, yeah. you know. And um, and because we were getting off on that, what we had, you know, the the audience could sense it, I think, you know, that, and that's why we were never afraid to play with, with any band, you know, because we had the uniform that nobody else could could put on at the right. time. Right, right. It was, I mean, I can, I can tell you as a young kid, for my first uh, experience with Judas Priest is uh, Unleashed in the East. So this is, I just, I walk into a record store, me and my friend are looking at records, and like, I just see that cover and I'm like, this band looks fucking awesome. <laughs> so I was like, I got to buy this. And I had heard the name before, but I hadn't heard you guys. And so we bought it. We actually bought it together. And uh, man, I tell you, I must have stared at that record cover for probably 24 hours of my life. <laughs> just like, just wasting time. Because like, this is the fucking raddest band I've ever seen in my life. Just everything, you know, it was just, it was everything. You know, like to a, a teenage kid, like you were just... It was so metal and cool and aggressive, and you know the and then the songs just, you know, to me that was, it was weird. It was weird when I heard "Victim of Changes" on you know "Sad Wings of Destiny" because I was so used to the live version, which is really like, you know, that you guys heavied up all of yeah, the yeah. Songs on it. I mean, like to a whole another level. Even the guitar tones, the even the drumming, you know, Les Binks killing it on, you know, a lot of those songs. So Yeah. I, yeah. Like I say, we struggled in the early days to capture the band's energy and and, and power on an on the album. You know, and that was our frustration, I think. But it was still very early days, you know. We were just transitioning from prog rock, basically, progressive right. blues. Right. You know, because rock really wasn't, we had rock and roll, but we didn't really have rock and prog until about 1970, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd see bands like maybe uh, Led Zeppelin called a rock band, you know, or maybe even The Who, you know. Um, but like, like, so when we started in the, in the 60s, people didn't, you know, uh, rock, hard rock, heavy rock, heavy, heavy metal, none of that existed. Right. Those people names, didn't, the names didn't, didn't exist. People didn't know what music we played because we didn't really know what music we were playing. All I know was that in my mind, consciously or subconsciously, I was trying to create this riffing to orientated style of music, you know, that wasn't out there in abundance because everything was kind of blues orientated because we had so many progressive blues bands you know, Jethro Tull, Fleetwood right. Mac, Rodwin Peak, 10 years after, Wishbone Ash, Chicken Shack, you know, um, so, and Rory Gallagher, so many great progressive blues artists, but it was not, I liked, I liked them all. I really was a big fan, but it wasn't really for me. So when bands like Budgie came along, and, uh, and then when I heard the Sabbath album, I'm thinking, Fuck, thank fuck for that. You know, right. somebody else out there can write riffs because I've been writing these riffs, you know. Um, like I say, when, when I saw Hendrix at the Isle of Wight, I'd already put down Victim of Changes and, and different songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I was still that snot, snot 19 year old kid um, that uh, was still like a, a drooling at the, at the mouth kind of fan, you know, just wanting to even just be with within a thousand yards of, of, of these icons, you know, on stage. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I tell you what, man, this is, uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And thank you, Rob, and good luck to you and the band. Look forward to seeing you in, in the UK in September. I definitely will be there. Um, awesome. dude, I would love for you to be there. Love me for you. and AJ, you know, we're, we're going to be there, you know, so, um, 
look forward to that. Yeah. And uh, give our love and best wishes to everybody, every metal fan out there, you know, um, until we can get out there and say a big hello in real life and um, and do what yeah. we're so much looking forward to doing. And that's, uh, again, delivering up the goods for everyone. Yeah. This has been a big deal for me. I play a flying V because of you. So, <laughs> me, all those years, so st- all well, those years staring at that, <laughs> at that goddamn album cover. <laughs> yeah, but what you can do, you're the front man of the band, kick-ass vocalist, serious attitude, and you still play the guitar and the guitar solos. So, full credibility to you, buddy. I look forward Thank to you, seeing brother. you do it again real soon. Ladies and gentlemen, right there. The mighty, mighty, mighty KK Downing, KK's priest. No fucking regrets! With Rob Flynn.